Hi, hello, hello, everybody. Doug Miles with you, along with Don Henderson. Welcome to Sports Talk, and uh, I'm here in Sarasota, Don up in New Jersey tonight. And uh, uh, Don, uh, a little rain in both areas, but uh, I think we'll be okay. I think it blew through, and uh, as you said, Don, before we went on, looks like uh, we'll get the Yankee game in tonight, right? Oh yeah, I don't think they'll have any problem. There, are, you know, a few little thunder showers around, and uh, one was going over the Bronx. Uh, oh, I guess about a half hour or so ago, and. Uh, but uh, it looks right now like the lack of any problem. It's very whatever it is. It's very short anyway. Down along the shore here, it lasted about ten minutes. But they're you know little clusters all around. You don't know where they're going to break out. Well, we're going to talk a lot of uh, different things tonight. We're going to start off with uh, baseball talk, and a real great pleasure to welcome our first guest, Don. I know uh, you and I have both read his work over the years, and people around the country know his work for the New York Times. Pulitzer Prize-winning sports writer uh, Ira Burko joining us. Of course, uh, his latest book out is uh, something you and I are interested in, Don, and I call The Summers at Shea and other Mets stories. We're joined by uh, Ira Burko on the telephone tonight. Ira, thanks for joining us. How are you tonight? Well, it's my pleasure. Good. And uh, in Manhattan, the, the skies are pretty clear. Well, I'll tell you, Iris, it's interesting. Every time the uh, you know the Mets find up find themselves in a rain delay, we either get Bob Murphy or uh, doing a little uh, reminiscing about the beginnings of Shea Stadium, or we get Howie Rose doing a little something on some of the great ball games at Shea Stadium. So we're in the right vein tonight. Yeah, well, when uh, when the Mets are in a rain delay, the way they're going this year, they're very happy it's a rain delay. <laughs> well, you can't say that now because they've turned the corner a little bit. Uh, a little bit, yeah, it, a little bit. It, they certainly got some hope. A month ago, they didn't really have any hope. But now with Wheeler and Harvey and, you know, uh, a few ins and outs here, uh, yeah. yeah, it looks like Collins may have seen the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I think they should try to, to pitch a Harvey every game if they can. <laughs> yeah, Harvey going uh, tonight as we do the show live on a Monday night out in San Francisco tonight, and uh, and kind of you know, going back to your book, Ira. I mean, uh, when I first saw Harvey pitch, I think a lot of people have the the comparison. Uh, maybe not exactly the same uh, motion, but very similar uh, in, in demeanor on the mound to uh, the great Tom Seaver. At least in the first half a year, uh, you get that feeling with uh, with Matt Harvey. Yeah, well, you know, Seaver. Uh, uh, Harvey has a, a few years to go yet to really be compared to uh, Seaver, uh, but it looks like you know he's on the road. And uh, I mean, the Seaver was such a competitor, and and he had such great stuff. Uh, and you know, he he was he was just special. And uh, I guess you know Harvey has the potential uh, to do something along the lines of what Seaver did, but. You know, Seaver was just so uh, extraordinary, and you know, and he was this extraordinary that he still has the highest vote in the history of the Hall of Fame. Uh, he had, I think, close to 92 percent votes, uh, and that was that's a record uh, beyond Williams, beyond DiMaggio. Uh, I don't, uh, they weren't voting this way for in Babe Ruth's time, but. Um, uh, all the others. Uh, it was. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. So, um, yeah, I'm. I'm rooting. I'm rooting for Harvey uh, to come along and you know and be that good because it's just. It was so much fun to watch Seaver uh, in his glory days and uh, how nice if it could be repeated. Yeah, and, and, and I think way, when they talk about uh, Seaver and they talk about Harvey is one thing, but the comparisons that they've really dug been using uh, on SNY has really been more good and. Uh, and Harvey, because uh, Gooden was only 19 and threw the ball uh, somewhere, you know, in the upper 94, 95, 96 miles an hour, whereas Harvey's at 97, 98. Uh, yeah. But they're comparing them in the in the first numbers of games that they pitched respectively, and I think I read that uh, it, it's a better comparison. Your observation, in my view, has always been correct. Don't make Hall of Fame suggestions on one year. <laughs> you know, yeah, take and, your time. And- uh, and and good uh, didn't um, I mean he flamed out really and uh, a lot of it had to be you know how he comported himself and and he's talked about this he has a new book out and he's and he's talked about this um, but uh, uh, he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a smart a smart lad uh, and he in, in many ways threw away an incredible talent uh, Seaver on the other hand. Uh, was very careful with his body, and uh, and his brain uh, followed suit. So uh, 
uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at, at long term, uh, not just for a season or two or even three. Right. Doug? The name of the book is, is Summer is at Shea, and, and you have some great stories not only about uh, uh, Tom Sutter, but all the, uh, you know, the, the high drinks of what went on and great behind-the-scenes stories of, uh, of the Mets when they started at Shea back in 19... 19- 64. Uh, I guess these are, a lot of these are based on your articles over the years, too, right? Ira? Yeah, uh, they're, uh, you know, I was uh, around the, uh, covering uh, uh, a lot of stuff. I was a columnist for first for a Scripps Howard Syndicate Newspaper Enterprise Association, and then the New York Times for 26 years. And so uh, one of my jobs was to, uh, to write about the, these teams. And uh, so almost 40 years of, of of covering uh, the Mets and uh, through through all the ups and downs uh, from um, Casey Stengel, uh, you know, through Seaver, um, uh, Yogi Berra, uh, and um, you know, Gooden, Strawberry, uh, and one of my favorite players and uh, and and uh, a guy who I think should be in the Hall of Fame, Keith Hernandez. Well, and no the, question. When he came over in the Cardinals, he was the last link to sort of turn things around and. Uh, be in the championship run, and, and he's done also a, a very solid job uh, on television as an analyst. So yeah, Hernandez he is, is really a part of the Mets. Yeah, I think he and Darling are, are really good on television. Uh, and um, But I thought that Hernandez... Uh, I once, I'll just to quote myself once, I, I said that, uh, you know, from the press box, you, you could almost hear his mind grinding. He was thinking so hard. And as a fielder, I don't know of another first baseman in the history of baseball who changed the other team's strategies by the way he played first base. Uh, with a man on second, for example, and, uh, and no outs uh, at a close game, the batter, the batter couldn't bunt. Uh, because uh, uh, Hernandez was in on it so fast, he would throw the guy out at first at, at third base, uh, and he would even he would even cover the, uh, down the third base line for a butt. I mean, he was he was amazing as a fielder, and he was a good hitter and a clutch a clutch player. So uh, he, he, uh, Hernandez and I write about Hernandez in the book, of course, and uh, he was always one of my favorites. Uh, but you're right, uh, uh, he and Darling are very good uh, analysts on television. Very very solid, and I. Uh... Only one I would compare him to a little before your time. Uh, the guy that really initiated uh, throwing the runners out at third base was a former Philadelphia Athletic by the name of Ferris Fain, who was a great defensive first baseman, but it's a little before your time. No, he's not before my time. He, he might have been before <laughs> your time. Uh, but I, re- I remember Ferris Fain as uh, being the, uh, the American League batting champion two years in a row, I think, in 51 and 52. Well, he was a great player and a great first yeah. baseman. As I said, when... You tried to bunt against Ferris Fain, he was fearless. He, he, uh, uh, well, that, that's he, a, it would be 15 feet from home plate when you put the bunt down. Well, that, uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a good observation. Uh, of course, we know that um, uh, he didn't do himself uh, any, any justice by uh, uh, once uh, he kicked first base. On the, uh, he was out on a play, and, uh, and he kicked first base and broke his toe. Right. And, uh, and he was out for about <laughs> half a year or something. <laughs> Well, we've had a few of those players Her- around. Hernandez, over the years. Hernandez never did that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you can say one thing about the broadcasters right now. When O'Neill comes in and they show the pictures of some of the things he did in the dugout, it's lucky he didn't kill himself. Oh yeah, yeah, Paul O'Neill. Yeah, he's a, he was a, lo- <laughs> a lovely man, and, uh, and and no one had a greater heart than um, than O'Neill. And it was interesting that uh, I met O'Neill. I was covering uh, Pete Rose's going for uh, you know, Ty Cobb's home run, uh, uh, base hit the record, and uh, so the last couple of weeks of it, and a lot of reporters were following it. I was one of them, and uh, so I'm standing uh, behind the batting cage, and I see a Cincinnati Reds rookie who had just come up, and there was so much tumult about you know Rose and all this stuff, and uh, and so I went over to the rookie, I introduced myself, and he said his name was Paul O'Neill. And he was an outfielder. He was from Ohio. And uh, uh, and I said, well, what do you make of all this? He said, this is unbelievable. This, is this the way the, the major leagues are all the time? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he, made a, he made a very good career for himself. And um, uh, what we had in common, I knew he was from Ohio. And, and uh, I went to my I graduated from undergraduate school at Miami University in Ohio, and uh, so did his brother. 
So, uh, and at one point, uh, he introduced me to his brother some years later. But uh, and his and his daughter, his sister Molly O'Neill, was a uh, food critic, a restaurant critic for the New York Times. What, uh, so we overlapped. So I got to know Molly. Mm. Well, you mentioned Pete Rose, and of course, I was fortunate enough to be broadcasting the night that uh, he uh, is one of the few times that uh, Stan Musial and he were in the same ballpark. We were broadcasting the game at Veterans Stadium in Philly, and of course, he broke Stan uh, Musial's record uh, in the National League, and and uh, yeah. it was it was really some uh, some night in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can always get into a, a discussion about, you know, should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? And in fact, I have two pieces in my book relating to uh, Rose and, and the Mets. Uh, and, um, you know, my, my contention is that without question, Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, because in the, uh, the Dowd report, which investigated Rose in, in his gambling, uh, the conclusion was that he gambled on baseball as a manager. And the conclusion was also that he did not bet on baseball. There's no evidence that he bet on baseball as a player or even a player manager. So if he's to go in the Hall of Fame, he's to go in the Hall of Fame as a player and, and not as a manager. And so there was no taint on Rose as a player. And my uh, contention is that uh, he should be in the Hall of Fame as a player. Now, if, if organized baseball wants to keep him out of the clubhouse, if they want to keep him out of the front office of places, that's up to them. But as far as the Hall of Fame is concerned, Pete Rose should be in it. One of those famous uh, stories that you have in the book are is Pete Rose and Bud Harrelson in the 73 uh, playoffs, right? Uh, with a right. little scuffle at second base there. Real, real famous for all Mets fans. They remember that. And uh, yeah. uh, Pete Rose had, had the size uh, advantage over Harrelson, but Harrelson did pretty well for himself that day. Well, yeah, he did, but that was that was Rose, you know, uh, hell bent on winning, and uh, you know, of course, in that All Star game, uh, he crashed into uh, his good friend. It was a catcher for the Tigers, uh, Fosse. Uh, uh, Fosse. Yeah. Fosse. yeah, and Fosse was never the same after that. It was an All Star game, but but Rose was playing. Rose was Charlie Hustle from the day he got into the major leagues until until the day he left as a player. Yeah, I know. I I, I I love Rose. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's the only man to be named to as a starter in five different positions in the All-Star game. Uh, first base, second base, third base, left field, and right field. I mean, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. Well, I'll tell you, it was a, it was a different era uh, of baseball in those days. It's not uh, as we see today, but the one thing that uh, I remember dramatically was the last game played at the Polar Grounds, and, of course, uh, that day, Musial hit two home runs with a doubleheader against the Mets, and then they moved over to Shea Stadium. And it's interesting, as I said earlier, when Bob Murphy describes the new Shea Stadium uh, and the beauty of Shea Stadium, as opposed to when they left Shea Stadium and talked about the rambles of it. Oh yeah, well, no, I, I, I mean, Shea, Shea was was never a beautiful uh, stadium, uh, and uh, it was. I mean, but I'll tell you, I uh, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, if you're going to talk about a beautiful ballpark, it's Wrigley Field. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Sure, uh, you had the magic of uh, of of the planes going over through every thirty seconds oh, too. Even made it more right. more more fun to be there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, you know when you're when you're before a game, you're interviewing somebody in the in the dugout or on or uh, behind the batting cage as we did. And uh, then you had to halt the interview because a plane was going over and you couldn't hear anything. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's one of the that's one of the weaknesses in all sports of having a great degree in engineering and not having any idea of what the Robert Moses wanted that ballpark out there and had no conception of what baseball was all about. <laughs> right. No. Exactly right. But uh, uh, but a lot of history was made at uh, at Shea Stadium and in you know, a lot of interesting games and uh, you know uh, and it was fun and uh, you know then then Willie Mays showed up you know first first right. as a Giant but then you know then as a Met and uh, uh, and there were some 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 nice days with, with you know even you know with Willie Mays who was one of the great players of all time of course and uh, even Duke Snyder came back to play for a while. Yeah, Duke Snyder, Richie Ashburn, uh, and I, I, I covered it when Gil Hodges, uh, you know, that the, the great uh, uh, 69 season, 70, uh, 
And Hodges was an interesting man too, a very very classy guy. And uh, do you think uh, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Uh, I don't know if his statistics hold up, but again, uh, sometimes you can look strictly at statistics. So what did he mean to the team? I mean, uh, you know, it's along the lines perhaps of Hernandez. Um, uh, so you have to look, you know, beyond just, um, you know, what the baseball reference says. And um, I don't know. I, I haven't, you know, I, I didn't see Hodges play, really. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, his career, I mean, I was already uh, into my tw- uh, 20s, but, by the, you know, and um, when did he uh, 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 retire? About 1961 or two. And uh, uh, right, I mean, he played in L.A. for he played there for a bit, but I saw him play almost every game when he came yeah. up for the Dodgers until uh, they left in '58 to go to California. Yeah. Um, well, so I can't I can't really uh, you know say that uh, he deserves being the Hall of Fame or not. Uh, um, but uh, you know uh, he was a presence and uh, and he was a, an important, a very important player on one of the great teams of all time. Those those Dodgers right. of the '50s. You know, maybe maybe all those wonder, guys should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. You always, you always wonder if Yogi know, hadn't passed away from the heart attack. I know Yogi took over and they went to the series that year, but uh, would they have had three or four or five years of you know contention for a World Series after that if he had stayed? Uh, you know, yeah. Alive? Well, I was with uh, uh, Shamsky recently. We had lunch, Art Shamsky, and. Uh, Shamsky was on the 69 Mets, uh, the amazing Mets, Miracle Mets, and um, uh, he said that if, if Hodges had stayed, they, they would have won more pennants. That's, that was his contention. Yeah. So, well, I think that's his strongest suit for going into the Hall of Fame was what he did uh, yeah, as a in Washington, but what he did with, yeah. the, uh, with the New York Mets. But to be yeah. honest with you, uh, as much as they try every year to talk about him going into the Hall of Fame, I have to be honest to say, as much as I admired his play and his leadership as a manager, I, I don't know unless he had uh, done something like Joe Torre did and stayed on as a manager or, uh, a number of years at one. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I would say he was Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I I tend to agree with that. Yes. So. Um, yeah. Well, I, I know we kept it a little bit longer than we said, but uh, we want to have you on and then talk a little baseball tonight. The name of the book is called Summers at Shea, and I know it just came out, but uh, available every all the bookstores, I guess. Do you have a website, too, you want to give out, Ira? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I, I want to keep bookstores in uh, in business. <laughs> so, uh, I have <laughs> one, one last question for me, Ira. What, what, if you had to focus in on the book and... One uh, one item that you think is, is something that's really uh, close to you and, and that you enjoy writing most. Um, uh, one of the one of the great interviews of all time. Uh, people ask me who are, who are the the great interviews, and um, uh, uh, Pete Rose is one. Muhammad Ali is is another, and Casey Stengel. And I have a couple pieces with Casey Stengel, and uh, I, these are people as a reporter. Uh, you could ask them one question, and they could fill up your notebook with insightful, colorful stuff. Uh, and so I have a few pieces with Casey. And I also include, for the uh, your listening audience, a letter that Casey once wrote me. Uh, and all I can tell you about the letter is he starts one paragraph with a semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or you and, and don't he, understand the rest of it. And then he continues on the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, check it out. It's, it's great to have you with us. And uh, we'll, we have your number. We'd like to have you on sometime later later on this year. I'd love to have you back on. But uh, thanks okay. for joining us tonight. Okay, my pleasure. All right, thanks, guys. All right, bye-bye. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us on the uh, program tonight, and uh, there's a guy down. He can just talk uh, for hours, uh, not only just baseball, because he's covered it all. One appealing surprise as a sports writer. Uh, it's hard to do in any field, but particularly in sports. <laughs> no question about that. That is very, very difficult. And uh, uh, as you said, he came from Chicago, or as he said, he came from Chicago, so he had a great ba- uh, background in baseball. And then, of course, coming to New York and being a part of that bet situation. The highs and lows and all the things that happened uh, with the Mets over there was years, Mrs. Payson and all the ownership yep. transitions and all the other things. Uh, it's an ever-ending story. 
Yeah, I remember Mrs. Joan Payson. She used to sit in that, uh, the owner's box. They show her on TV. Uh, uh, used to wear the very fancy clothes. I guess she was uh, an old New York money person, right? Isn't that the, the, the money uh, that that's bought the team originally? And, of course, uh, M. Donald Grant and those years where it really fell apart after uh, Mrs. Payson uh, left us and uh, went through those terrible years of the 70s and then came back in the uh, mid-'80s when uh, David Johnson came in and won that one World Series. They probably should have won more. Of course, that was a, a state of Keith Hernandez, and then those guys, that was a, a lot of hijinks going on there, not all of it good. Well, not only that, but, but, you know, there are several teams that you look at over through the years. The Cleveland Indians would be one that had five great starters plus a nice bullpen, uh, you know, when, when they were at the height of theirs in 1952. Uh, but the New York Mets during their heyday, uh, you know, had as good a pitching staff as you could get. And, uh, you know, there aren't very many teams that you can look at, not only in today's game, but back then, where they could go three, four, five deep or even have to go to a minor league team and, and bring somebody up that wasn't an adequate pitcher. Yeah, we didn't have a chance to really get into the 69 team too much with Otter, but, yeah, you look at that pitching staff, it wasn't only Seaver, it was Jerry Kuzman. He had, uh, I guess this was more a little later on, John Matlock came onto that team. Nolan Ryan was on that staff. Uh, he had guys like uh, uh, Don Cardwell, who was a good veteran pitcher. He had a great bullpen. He had Tug McGraw. I mean, he had a pitching lineup there, a lot of them Hall of Famers, and uh, you almost wonder why the Mets, even in that era, didn't win more. They did make the 73 series, but... Of course, you had the big red machine then. You had the Pirates, who were a, a powerhouse team then. So uh, the, the competition was much fiercer, I think, uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s in that division. Yeah, and, and he talked for a moment about Art Shamsky, uh, a name that not many yeah. people remember, uh, but yet yeah, was a, a big part. Ron Swoboda and Art Shamsky, uh, uh, you know, not superstar players, but made superstar contributions at special times. I still contend that the Ron Frobota catch in the World Series is the greatest catch I've ever seen in a World Series, maybe maybe just in baseball, but that diving catch out of nowhere, uh, to me, is still the greatest catch I've ever seen in, in the playoffs or a World Series. Against David and, especially, and especially for a player that wasn't known for being a defensive player. No. But if, was but if I remember <laughs> correctly, Doug, he made two of them. He made one in St. Louis, uh, if right. I'm not mistaken, uh, that was – you know, during the whole stretch of the pennant race, another very, very big uh, uh, catch that he made. So, to me, I remember both of those catches. And, and but you're right, the one of the World Series obviously was more dramatic because it's a World Series. It came out of nowhere. It was that David Johnson was uh, the batter, kind of a low liner to uh, right field. And uh, out of nowhere, Svoboda came in and, and made that catch, the snow cone catch. He also had, I remember Tommy Agee made a couple of great catches in that series. Uh, he had Cleon Jones in the outfield. I mean, Don Clendenin, there was another guy that, a veteran that came over, and uh, and I think he came from Houston, if I'm not mistaken, and really helped the Mets that year with, with some home runs. I think you're right. He was most noted for being with Pittsburgh, but I think he had moved out of Pittsburgh, and I think he was a utility player at that time right. with, Houston, with Houston. You're exactly right. And then the Mets got him, and uh, and he really had a, uh, a very big influence for a one-year period. Yeah, great, great teams. And, well, I are on down the road again because uh, when, you, when you write for the Times for 26 years, you, you tend to collect a lot of stories. We just barely touch the surface. But, again, if you want a great baseball book and some uh, funny stories, some uh, good dramatic stories as well, just check it out. It's called Summers at Shea. But uh, so, some good stuff. I'm glad that uh, – I know last week we tried to get him on. We'll uh, – couldn't quite hook up last Monday, but I'm glad that he was able to reschedule uh, for tonight. Absolutely. It's always, uh, you know, it's just a lot of fun to talk to people that have covered the game for a long period of time, and especially, as you said, uh, not only covered the game, but a big part of the game and had an opportunity to, to see some of the great players. I was shocked when he said he had re- he remembered Ferris Fain that well, because <laughs> you, you, you got to be a little over to remember Ferris Fain. You know, you know where I know that name from? There's a song called uh, Van Lingo Mungo. Have you ever heard that song, Don? It's all been I have, names. yes. And Charles yes. Fain is in that song. Dave, Dave Frischberg did it. But that's how I know that name. I didn't know he played for uh, Cleveland. Is that what you said? Cleveland he played for? No, I played, no, I played for Connie Beck at the Philadelphia Athletics. Oh, that's right. He was, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was part of that Pete <laughs> Suter, Eddie Juice, uh, 
Uh, he was the first baseman. Pete Suter was the second baseman. Eddie Juice was the shortstop. And uh, uh, on, on not good, not real good teams, but pretty good teams. But at the end of Mr. Mack's career at, uh, in the 1949-50-51 uh, era. Yeah, we got to, we'll play that song one day. I'll try and dig it up. But uh, if you haven't heard it out there, it's all baseball names uh, uh, right. put together in a kind of a rhyming fashion. Dave Frischberg did it, and it really is a great job that he did. And uh, all those, and Van Lingo Mungo was actually named a ball player. Uh, I don't know where he played or how long, but he. But it was all baseball names. And, of course, I think back then, I, I think he uh, played, the I think he played for the A's, too, Doug. Did he? I okay. Van Lingo I, Bungo, he I think Van Lingo Bungo was an A also. I can't remember exactly, yeah. but I think so. <laughs> I thought maybe you called his games, Don. Didn't you call his uh, at-bats? <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on, one more quick thing. It was kind of funny when uh, I was saying about Tom Seaver getting the most uh, Hall of Fame votes, the highest percentage, and I think you and I know one of the guys that didn't vote him in. <laughs> on the first ballot. <laughs> yes, Bill Collin was never a first ballot picker. He he made you wait at least one year before he put you on the ballot. I, I guarantee he was one of the two or three that did, and, and he wasn't shy about telling you either. That's why he did. Yeah. He said ninety-two point something percent, the highest ratio ever to go into the Hall of Fame, Tom Seaver. Yeah. But I guarantee you, part of that uh, seven point eight percent was Bill Collin. Is one of them. Is one of them. Uh, it's one of them. <laughs> 